I want to say blessings. Uh, thank you uh, uh, once again uh, for uh, being a part of our Bible class. It's so important to be able to study God's word uh, because it is the word of God uh, that gives you the strength and the energy and the insight to do what God has asked you to do. And when you stay disconnected from the word of God, it's hard to hear from God. Uh, and so on uh, this evening, we want to be able to spend time in God's word so that we can be able to hear the things that God has uh, for us to do. Let us go to God in a word of prayer. Holy and righteous Father, bless us, dear Father, as we study your word on tonight. Give us insight, wisdom, give us understanding. Help us, dear Father, that we will apply the things that we've heard uh, to our daily lives. In your holy and righteous name, amen. And so one of, what I want to talk about uh, a little further on tonight as we deal with relationships is I want to talk about toxic relationships. I want to talk about toxic relationships. And tonight I want to look at three relationships. Tonight I want to look at three relationships that are found in the scriptures uh, so that we can glean, so that we can learn from the things that are found in the scriptures. I believe that God put these relationships uh, in his word so that we can understand, so that we can identify what to avoid and what to stay away from. Uh, all of the relationships that we're going to look at tonight uh, are romantic relationships. We started off looking at Cain and Abel, uh, which was a family relationship uh, and a dysfunction that was in the family. Uh, but on tonight, uh, I want to look at uh, three relationships, but these relationships are romantic relationships. Uh, and so hopefully, as we take a good look at these, we'll be able to grow and learn uh, and be able to move ahead uh, in a healthy state. Uh, the first uh, relationship that I want us to look at uh, is actually the first relationship that ever existed. Here we are in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, and beginning at verse 8, and the Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, amongst the trees of the garden. So one of the things that we begin to look at as we examine this first relationship is that at, up, up to this point, they've sinned. They have disobeyed God, and the very thing that God told them not to do is what they have done. And so now, when God shows up, the husband and the wife, they both together, simultaneously, hide themselves in the bushes. When God shows up, when, when God shows up, it wasn't just Adam that just went and hid himself in the bushes. The Bible says it was Adam and Eve at the sound of God's voice. They hid themselves. The problem with that is that you would hope at least one of them that when they heard the sound of God, said, no, nah, we can't run from God. As we examine this relationship, you have to be very careful who you connect yourself to. You have to be very careful of who you latch yourself to because in every relationship, uh, there, there's, there's only a few things that are going on. Either one person, uh, one spouse is converting the other, or the other spouse is converting the other. Uh, and so you have to be very careful because if you have, if you're connected to somebody that's not connected to God, that person will pull you into the bushes. And so whenever I hear God's voice, I don't want to uh, be connected to somebody who pulls me into the bushes because they're not in a good state with God. How is it that both of them got into the bushes? How is it that both of them decided that the bushes was a good place to hide from God? Number one, if you went into the bushes, then you still need to learn some things about God. You need to start going to Bible class because if, uh, if you've been walking with God all of this time and you thought the bushes were going to hide you from God, that's a problem. You got to be very careful of the person that you're connected to uh, because that person may end up pulling you into a situation where you end up having a false confidence. There are some people, uh, they started off in the Lord's house. They started off, they, they grew up uh, hearing the preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ. And one day they messed around and they fell in love and they got connected to somebody that's not walking with God. 
And so uh, anytime that Sunday roll around, instead of you being in the Lord's house, you're in her house. Instead of you being in the Lord's house, you're in his house, and you have this false confidence that you think that you're in a good state as if God will give you a pass because you're in love. Because God will give you a pass because the person that you're connected with is making you feel so good that instead of running at the sound of God's voice to God, you end up running away from God in the bushes. You have to get out of the bushes. So the Bible says here, they're, they're, they're in the bushes. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, where are you? Now notice, God did not say, Eve, where are you? The Bible called for Adam. The Bible called for the man. So you have to understand this is, this is very, very important in, in, in relationships. And this part is for the men. It really doesn't matter what the woman does. In a marriage, God is going to hold the man responsible as the leader. Even if the woman takes over and she starts making some decisions and she starts doing certain things, you can't go to God as a man. Uh, that's why we have to be very careful, especially in this day and time, that we encourage masculinity in our men to be able to stand up and do the things that God has called you to do. Because regardless of what society says, uh, regardless of what's going on uh, in your home, on Judgment Day, God is going to address everybody in the house, but God is going to call the man, and he's going to address the man. You're responsible. There may be some women that say, hey, listen, he ain't responsible for me. It doesn't matter what you say. God has set up a system. So you can be strong, you can be independent, you can do whatever you want to do, but listen, on Judgment Day, God is going to address the man and say, where are you? Why in the world? Are you not in the designated spot? Normally when God would come at the cool of the day, they would never be in the bushes. But now, because of some interactions and things that they have done in their marriage, both of them are hiding, and the first person that God calls is where in the world is the man? Why is it, why is the man hiding in the bushes? At least a man should be able to step up and say, I'm gonna have to face God for my family, even if the woman didn't want to come out the bushes, the man should have at least been out ready to meet God at the appointed time to the point where God said, I shouldn't have to be looking for you. Many times in our churches and many times in our fellowship, you have women uh, that feel from wall to wall. I wonder on the Lord's day that God does not come to many of our worship services and say, where are the men? Where where are the leaders? You don't get a pass. Sending your wife to worship does not substitute your worship. And so, and so uh, you, you, you have to be very, very careful. Some, uh, there are some men, their wives don't want to come to worship. So they say, you know what, uh, happy wife, uh, happy home. That's not true. Because if God is not happy, it does not matter if your wife is happy. If God is not happy, it does not matter uh, if, uh, if she's uh, on the moon and she's just loving everything that you do. If you're not walking with God, it doesn't matter if you have a happy wife. Your first responsibility, is God happy with me? And if God is not happy with me, then it doesn't matter the joy that's in the house. Sometimes you have to disrupt the joy of the house so that you can be right with God. Sometimes, I want you to hear it again, sometimes you have to disrupt the joy in the house. Sometimes you have to disrupt the laughter in the house so that you can be right with God. Because you're going to have to face God because you spent all of your time making your spouse happy. You spend all your time making your wife happy, all your time making your wife, your, your husband happy. And God said, wait a minute, seek ye first. You forgot about me, and because you forgot about me, then you will suffer. 
I honestly believe that God has disrupted many relationships because he could not see himself in the relationship. And then you turned around and, and prayed to God, God, why wouldn't, uh, how come you didn't save my relationship? God said, I was never in it. So how are you going to ask me to come down and save your relationship that may be falling apart when in the beginning you never asked me to be a part of it? The last time I saw you was at the wedding. After you said I do, y'all left me and never asked me to come along. You invited me to the wedding and then left me at the wedding and the next time you called me is only when you was having problems. I was never in your marriage. I was just a visitor at the wedding. So they're both in the bushes, and the first thing that God says is, Adam, where are you? You continue reading, and the Bible says in the beginning at verse 10, and he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and then he says, I was afraid. I was afraid because I was naked, and then I hid myself. God, I heard your voice. And it made me look at myself. And I did not like what I saw. And so because I did not like what, uh, what I was looking at, I hid myself. But, but what he did not say is, my wife is in the same state as me. Some relationships are not healthy. Because the relationship that you're in right now Neither one of you are bringing each other closer to God. During this time and during this season, people have been talking about relationships and things. Some relationships need to break up. You know why you need to break up? So you can go to heaven. Somebody says, do y'all get along? Yeah, we get along. Uh, how she look? Oh, she bad. She fine. How he look? Oh, he's the man of my dreams. Uh, okay, so what's going on? No, you need to break up because we can't, we can't help each other go to heaven. There are some relationships that they are awesome. They have a great chemistry. They do a lot of great things and they're doing some, and, and, and she's a boss and he's a boss and they do it, but they're not helping each other get closer to God. And so because the, because the spouses are far away from God, but they're close to each other. Both of them are far away from, uh, from God, but they're close to each other. And then you're raising children in a godless house. And the only time that you want, to, want God to really come in is so that, so that God can preserve your plans, not his. God comes in your house and say, this ain't even my house. I don't even dwell here. I'm a stranger in your house, and I'm a stranger in your relationship. And when y'all have pillow talk, y'all never talk about me. Y'all never study me. You never, you never ask, what, is, what does God require from our relationship? That never comes up in your relationship. The only thing that he talks to you about is how wonderful and beautiful you look and where we finna go and how we finna hang out. He always want to hang out. He want to hang out. Why are we, we're not on, we're not monkeys on trees or are we always hanging out? What's the vision and what's the goal? What are the spiritual plans of the house? He says, I looked at myself when I heard your voice and I did not like what I saw, so I left. Could that be the reason why a lot of men don't like coming to worship? Because the sound of God's voice and the preaching of his word, it causes them to look at themselves. They do not like what they see. And sisters, you got to be very careful because what you end up doing is you end up connecting to your, yourself to somebody who only feels comfortable in the bushes. And we're supposed to be free. Oh, we're supposed to be walking around free and confident, but we end up hiding in the bushes. He says, so I was naked. Notice what God says. And the Bible says in verse 11, and he said, who told you that you was naked? Has thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the Bible says in verse 12, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. This is what he says. Adam says, listen, let me tell you, God, let me tell you what happened. The woman that you gave me, the woman that you gave me corrupted me. 
She ate it of the tree, and then she gave it to me, and I ate, and that's why we're in this situation. Now, here's the thing. Everything that God makes is good. You know what the problem with Adam? He did not manage his relationship well. See, the problem was Adam. It wasn't even so much Eve. Now, Eve was deceived. But the other problem is Adam was not the leader that he needed to be. Because when his wife came with, uh, to him with the fruit, you know what he should have said? Even if she had already eaten, you know what he should have said? We can't eat of that. I'm not going to participate with you. Do you know how many relationships where one spouse is doing wrong and in order to keep the relationship together, the other spouse just follows along? And then you hate yourself. You hate yourself. Do you know how many relationships where one spouse uh, wants to spice up the relationship and they, so, uh, they start suggesting certain things with their spouse? And so in order for you to keep the relationship going, you start indulging in things that cause you to feel bad. You start feeling guilty. Your conscience starts bothering you and say, wait a minute, I don't think the thing that we're doing is pleasing to God. I don't think the thing that we're doing is causing God to smile. It wasn't that God gave him something bad. He didn't manage it well. One of the first lessons that we learned in, in the first relationship is that if one of them would have been strong enough, if one of them would have been able to stand, Maybe they would have been able to save their home or, or even salvage uh, uh, the relationship they had with God instead of losing it and getting kicked out. The reason why God had to kick them out is because both of them fell and are in the bushes. If there's anybody that's pulling you down, sometimes you got to be careful. Just because a person makes you feel good doesn't mean that you belong with them. There's, sometimes you'll have people who understand you. Uh, this is Adam's first relationship. He can say, hey, listen, I've never been with another woman before. Uh, she, uh, she's the first one that I've ever opened up to and expressed, uh, you know, my trials and, uh, and, and, and my, my dreams or, or my aspirations to. But just because somebody makes you feel good, your first priority in every relationship is, how does this connection please God? Because I'm going to tell you, there are some people, they have great personalities, they can make you laugh all day long, and they can make you feel like you're on the top of the world, and they can help cure your illness of, of loneliness. But I would rather struggle with loneliness and be with God than to be occupied with somebody who may be the light of my life, but I can't even find where God is. Because in a season and a time like this, you want God. As people are grieving and things are going on, all of a sudden people start lifting up and say, where is God? God said, oh, you want to look for me now? You want to look for me now when you had an opportunity to be with me then? The Bible says, seek the Lord now while he may be found. Seek him now while he may be found. Because the hardest time to look for the Lord is in the middle of a storm. Our second relationship is 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. So Ahab is king of Israel. And as the king of Israel, you have to understand, Israel is God's people. Israel only has one God, and that's Jehovah. Matter of fact, God has said, listen, there's no other God beside me. I'm your only God. Ahab is the king of Israel. And his, his focus is to serve God. But then he's married to a woman, and her name is Jezebel. The reason why you don't really know any women who are called Jezebel is because she was one of the most wicked women in the Bible. Uh, that's why you don't know, that's why you don't have any girlfriends called Jezebel. And if you do, you probably need to defriend them. Uh, and so uh, Ahab, his wife is named Jezebel. He's king of Israel and he's leading God's people. The Bible says in verse one, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. 
Elijah is the prophet of God. Ahab is the king of Israel over God's people. So if anybody is supposed to get along, if anybody is supposed to be in a good relationship, it's supposed to be Elijah and Ahab because both of them work for God. But Elijah came and rebuked the false prophets that Ahab had mingled up with. So here's the problem with Ahab. Ahab works for God but Ahab got into some bad company with some prophets and, and, and those prophets were of another religion. They served other gods other than Jehovah. And so uh, Ahab got influenced by these prophets and then Elijah comes and says, listen, all of these prophets are not of God. I'm of God. And so uh, Elijah showed out on Mark Carmel uh, and showed that Jehovah is the only God. So here we are in the text, and the Bible says that Ahab, uh, he was kind of feeling down because a lot of the people, all of his relationships that, uh, that he was connected to, um, they, they're now over with. So uh, uh, I just want to make a note here. If you're a Christian... If you're a child of God, you got to be very careful. Because remember, relationships only do two things. Relationships only do two things. Either it's bringing you closer to God or it's bringing you further away from God. But no relationship causes you to just stay the same. I hear a lot of people say today, uh, we're supposed to go out into the world and we, we're supposed to share the gospel to the world. That's true. Uh, but some, some of us, we go out into the world never to be found again. All your friends are on the outside of the Lord's house. But as the years go on, you've never brought any to obey the gospel. You've never led any. None of your friends look at your lifestyle and they say, you know what? I think I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. You know why? Because you're still going to the club with them. You're still drinking with them. You're still smoking with them. You're still cussing with them. You're still talking about people. You're still being jealous. You backbite worse than they do. You hate on people worse than they do. And they look at your life and say, well, I don't need to really go to worship with you. And I don't really need your God. And you're not even really evangelizing. Ahab is connected to prophets that are not of God and it has influenced him. Elijah comes and says, man, me and you are supposed to be close. What are you doing with them? You got to be careful. Sometimes your outside relationships with those in the world will cause you to hate your own brothers and sisters. If you get to the point where you started despising the church and you feel more comfortable with those in the world, it lets you know they're having more of an influence over you than your own brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm not saying that everybody in the Lord's house is perfect and got it all together, but I just know this. If I got the blood of Jesus Christ on me and you got the blood of Jesus Christ on me, we should be closer together than somebody who don't walk with God. And if you feel more comfortable with people who don't have the blood of Jesus Christ on them and don't walk with God, that says more about you than it says about the Lord's house. And so Ahab goes and he goes and tells his wife, he says, you know, because when you have a bad day and, and when things are not working out and, and I lost my friendships, you know what he does? He goes and he goes and tells his wife. The Bible says in verse two, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. When, uh, when Jezebel heard that Elijah, uh, what Elijah had done, Ahab goes and he go tells his wife, I had a bad day today. Elijah came and he just, he just ruined all my, my worldly relationships. The woman that he was connected to put a bounty on Elijah's head and said, listen, I'm going to kill you. By this time tomorrow, I'm going to kill you to the point where Elijah had to get out of town. One of the things that we learned from this relationship is that the woman that Ahab is married to is not a woman of God. She's not the Proverbs 30. Jezebel is not the Proverbs 31 woman. She's the woman where if you hurt my husband, 
I got a switchblade and I'm gonna cut you. We have to be very careful of the type of relationships. Some women have relationships like that where they go and they, they go tell a man, hey, I had a bad, and the only thing he's, he's able to do is to go fight for you. But shouldn't you be connected to somebody who can go to God and pray with you? You know what Ahab really needed to hear? When he went home and told his wife what happened? You know what she should have said? But you were wrong. Because you started to follow other gods and you end up leaving Jehovah. She didn't rebuke him. You know what she did? She supported his lifestyle and she supported his, his wrong way. You got to be careful. There are some people who love you so much, they don't rebuke you. They love you so much, they support what you do. You know uh, 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 that person has an addiction. So you know what you do? You love them so much. You're the one uh, that's buying them liquor. You're the one that's overfeeding them. You're the one that's giving them the drugs. You're the one uh, that's setting a place for them where they can indulge in things that bring them further away from God. All for the sake of peace. You got to be careful. Some relationships, the whole goal of the man or the whole goal of the woman is I don't want to disturb the other one. I just want to make peace. So instead of standing up and bringing him closer to God, you know what she does? She says, well, listen, I, well, we need to go kill him. She actually goes a step further. Ahab was just sad. He came home and he was just sad. You know who he was connected to? He was connected to a violent one. Some of you are in relationships with violent ones where you may be better, but they take you a step further. What relationship is taking you too far? And you say, you know what? I wasn't even trying to do all that. I wasn't trying to kill them. I was just letting you know I had a bad day. There's always somebody, there's always somebody if you connect it, they try to take you too far. They, 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 you weren't even going to sin. They're the one pressuring you. You were saying, hey, listen, I think we need to live holy. They're the ones always pressuring you. Say, come on, let's go, let's go another step further. They're the ones that make you feel guilty for not going as far as they want to go with you. And that's why you end up being far away from God. Somebody said, oh, you must be in a new relationship again because we ain't seen you at Bible class. You must be in a new relationship because you didn't, you didn't fell out the ministry or you, you're not serving like you used to. You must be connected to somebody and the person, that, they're taking you far and you're like, I don't even normally do this. I'm, I'm not, I don't even kill people. I come and say, hey, I don't even kill people like this. But the woman that you're connected to or the spouse that you're connected to, some people, some relationships, they have no boundaries. And you got to be very careful because sometimes you can be attracted to somebody who, who, who opens up your world to new possibilities. But the reason why they're opening up your world too much is because they don't have any boundaries. So you know what they'll do? They will wear anything. They will talk any kind of way. And, it, and at first glance, it looks like they're free. At first glance, it looks like, oh, my goodness, I, I, I want to have their confidence. It's not confidence. They have no boundaries. Some people don't fear God, and you fell in love with their freedom, and I'll dress whatever way I want to dress and talk to whoever I want to talk to. I'll go wherever I want to go. Uh, my body is free. My mind is free. My, my mouth, I say whatever. I, I can go wherever I want. Nobody holds me, and you can be attracted to that. But realizing that spirit is not the spirit of God because the spirit of God says, Lord, not my will, let your will be done. Lord, help me decrease so you can increase. Lord, order my steps. I don't go where I, I want to go and I don't do what I want to do. That spirit is not of God. The spirit of God says, Lord, order my steps. So Lord, wherever you want me to go, that's where I will go. And you need to be in a relationship with somebody who talks the same way. So instead of both of you being in the bushes, or instead of you being connected to somebody who's willing to go too far, both of you need to be able to say, Lord, not our will, but let your will be done. Lord, order our steps in this house. Let the Holy Spirit that's in me and that's in, that, in my spouse, Lord, lead us both in the way of righteousness. But if you don't have that type of speech, then you're already fighting the Holy Spirit. 
The one thing that you don't want to have is you don't want to have a good relationship with somebody, but the Holy Spirit in you is fighting the spirit or the demon in them. So here you are, and some relationships are there. Here you are, you're trying to have this relationship, and you're trying to, you're trying to work these things out. And your flesh is being pleased, but your spirit has no peace. And the person that you're connected to wants to go to the next level, but the Holy Spirit in you won't allow you to say yes to the proposal. The Holy Spirit in you won't allow you to propose to the person. And so you say, hey, listen, I think we're having a good time, but what you don't realize, in his mind, you're not the spiritual woman. You're not the type of woman that he sees himself because this right here, even though it feels good and good, but it's not of God, something's missing. The reason why uh, you love him and I, because your flesh is being tended to but the Holy Spirit in you it has no peace with him and so you're trying to make it work you're trying to fix it but in the back of your mind there's a voice that's saying you know this is not of God. Jezebel puts a hit out on Elijah and she's going too far and Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid, down, laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. So here once again, Ahab, with that uh, old sensitive spirit, he lays, comes home sad again, uh, and he, he's not eating anything. And so Jezebel comes in. And the Bible says in verse 5, but Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, why is thy spirit so sad that you eat no bread? And he said unto her, because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite and said unto him, give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, I want you to notice this in verse 7, and Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal, sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in the city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out, stone him, that he may die. Do you know what Jeze Jezebel did? She looked at her relationship, and she looked at her man. She said, yeah, look at him. He's all sad, and he's not, he not doing what he is. She said, baby, don't, don't worry. Get, start eating. She said, don't worry. I'll get, the, I'll get the field for you. And you know what she did? She wrote letters. And she sent it to the nobles, the officials of the town. And she said, hey, listen, find some people to lie on Naboth. And, and then I want you to, to, to claim that he is blaspheming God. And then what I want you to do is that I want you to stone him and I want you to kill him. And do you know what happened? He died. The woman that, that Ahab is connected to is an evil woman. Some of you don't know right now, some people that you're connected to, oh, they would do anything for you, and that's scary because you should never be in a relationship where a person would do anything for you because if you have a relationship with God, you can't do anything for me because your first relationship is supposed to be with God. Some people say, well, that person is loyal. You don't understand. That person is real loyal to me. That person is too loyal. It's possible to be too loyal because you can get into a point where you realize, wait a minute, I think you're willing to serve me more than you're willing to serve God. And that right there, that is dangerous. We've looked at two dysfunctional relationships where Adam did not become the man and the leader that he needed to be. And in the second relationship, you have a weak man named Ahab, and he's connected to a woman who's more loyal to him than to God. 
you have to be careful of your relationships because your relationships determine your altitude in life. They will either bring you down or they will bring you up. Some relationships, they hold you back. And there are some relationships, they propel you forward. When they're looking for the president of the United States, one of the things that they look for is they look for a man that can be able uh, to manage and navigate through the seasons and times uh, of, of the country. But at the same time, do you know also what they look at? They look at his wife. Because here's what they realize. In pol they know this in politics. Who you connected to can either ruin your career or propel you to great heights. A lot of people have different feelings about Obama and whatever. But one of the things that people realized is when they looked at his marriage, whether you agree with his policies or not, and I'm not here to talk about politics and, and, and whether or not he's good, or, but what I am saying is if you look at his marriage, what allowed him, and it came out of his own mouth, what allowed him to be as effective as he possibly could, or as he was, is that he was connected to somebody who not only supported him, but she was an outstanding woman herself, which shined a light on him. Obama could have still been Obama, but if you could connect to somebody, sometimes the people that you connect yourself to, they can change you. Which brings us to our third relationship. I want to I look at the third relationship, and we'll bring this to a close. In Exodus chapter 4, and beginning at verse 24, uh, the Bible says here that God came to Moses. And when God came to Moses, God said, hey, listen, here's your assignment. And your assignment is, I want you to lead my people out of slavery. Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. I want you to go talk to Pharaoh. I want you to go talk to the leader of the state, the leader of the nation, and I want you to boldly, with my support, Moses, I'm picking you. Moses, I'm picking you to be the new leader of my nation, of this Hebrew nation. But I want you to go to the Egyptian nation, and I want you to boldly face them and say, let my people go. Don't you worry about what you're going to say and don't you worry how you're going to accomplish it. God says, I'm going to take care of that for you. You have my full support. Now, what I want you to do before you start your campaign and before you go back to Egypt, this is what I want you to do. What I want you to do is I want you to circumcise your sons as a covenant between me and you. I want you to be obedient to me, Moses. You're the leader of your house, and I'm about to make you leader of Israel. But what I want you to do is I want you to circumcise your sons and so that we can have this covenant uh, between us. And then God had finished talking. But the Bible says that Moses wasn't really feeling circumcision. He had, he had went back and forth with God, and he had got to the point where he realized, okay, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm, I'm about to go to Egypt, and, and let me start packing. But circumcising my son, uh, I'm, 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 not really, I'm not really for that. So you know what Moses was about to do? Moses was about to ignore God. Before he even started his journey, he was about to ignore God because he really wasn't feeling the circumcision. Let's continue reading. And it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. What's not talked about in the story of Moses is that when, Moses, when God gave Moses the assignment, Moses decided, you know what, okay, I'm going to do the assignment, but I'm not circumcising. And the Bible says, as Moses was going along, God got in the way of Moses and said, I'm going to kill Moses. You know what? You would have never heard about Moses. You would have never heard about the Red Sea. You would have never heard about the plagues. You would have never heard about them crossing over. You know why? Because before Moses even got started, he was disobedient. That's what Moses was. Moses was disobedient. And when God saw the disobedience, you know what he said? I'm going to kill him. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill him. The Bible says in verse 25, Then Sephora, his wife, then Sephora took a sharp stone, 
cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, surely a bloody husband are you to me. So he let him go. Then she said, a bloody husband you are because of the circumcision. I, I want you to notice at the beginning of verse 26. So he let him go. God was about to kill Moses. God was about to kill Moses. But the, the wife he had, the Bible says she stepped in. It is the husband's responsibility. It's the father's responsibility to circumcise the son. By culture, by, by the commandment of God, it was his responsibility to circumcise his son. But he was disobedient. But because Moses was disobedient, God got in the way and said, I'm about to kill you. And right when God was about to kill him, Zipporah stepped in. His wife stepped in. His rib stepped in. The wife he chose to connect himself with. Relationships do two things. They either bring you closer to God or they bring you farther away from God. The Bible says Sephora stepped in, took a sharp stone, and she circumcised her son, and then she gave and said, you're a bloody husband to me. You know what she, she was not afraid to do? Zipporah, God never spoke to Zipporah. God was only speaking to Moses. But you know what Zipporah was not afraid to do? I'm going to save my house, and I'm going to be there for my husband. And instead of supporting his error, and instead of supporting uh, uh, his ways, she stepped in and did what God had asked uh, her husband to do. And you know what the Bible says? She threw it at her husband. And she was not afraid to rebuke her husband for the wrong that he had did. Why would you want to be in a relationship where somebody supports your wrong and don't check you when you're bad? Do you know why Moses passed through the Red Sea? Partially, outside of God, but partially because he had a good wife. He had a wife, he had a woman that when she heard what God said to her husband, she support, a help me is, I'm going to help you do what God, a help me is not somebody that's just going to help. A help me says, I'm going to help you do what God has caused you to do. So when your husband is not doing right, it's sinful for you to go along and you're not a help me. You're supposed to help them and bring them closer to God. If you see your spouse going and about to eat the fruit, you're not supposed to just watch her eat the fruit and talk to the serpent and you not interject and be like, first of all, why are you even talking to my wife? And then she passing you and you just going to eat the fruit. Your timidity is killing your relationship. But Sephora stepped in and said, no, we're not going to live like this. If God tells you to do something, you need to do it. She threw that at him. You're a bloody husband to me. Do what God asks you to do and check yourself. Do you know what Moses did after that? He went on to Egypt and he was able to stand before Pharaoh and he led the people out. But one of the people that he needs to thank is my wife. Matter of fact, when they were at the Red Sea banquet, and at the Red Sea banquet, uh, when they all stood around and they were all singing, the Bible says Miriam was singing and everybody having a good time. Uh, matter of fact, one of the things that Moses should have done is he should have stood up at the Red Sea banquet and said, I want to thank everybody uh, for your support. But the number one person I really want to think. There's some things that y'all don't even know. Before I even started this campaign, I want to thank my beautiful wife, Sephora, for standing up and, and helping me obey God. Because if I did not have the wife that I have, you would not see me here today. Relationships do two things. Relationships, all relationships, they do two things. They either bring you closer to God or they bring you far away from God. As you go throughout the rest of this week and as you begin to evaluate your life, I want you to really think, what kind of person am I in this relationship? Matter of fact, you could be the Christian in the relationship, but you're actually keeping the person that you're connected to. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's not good to be connected to you. Your speech is ungodly. Your actions are ungodly. And you say, I'm a good person, but I can't get to God with you. 
Maybe you need to disrupt the relationship so you can be closer to God. If you got to break up to get closer to God, do whatever you need to do. Because at the end of the day, let me tell you what matters. Being right with God matters. You'll have, you'll have marriages and they say, well, listen, we've been married for 40, 50, and 60 years. Oh, that's great. Just make sure through those 40 and 50 and 60 years that at least you can say at the end, we're good with God. What good is it to be married for 50 and 60 years and both of you lose your soul? The objective of marriage is not to stay together for a long time. That's not the, that's not the goal of marriage. The goal of marriage is we became better together and closer to God than we were apart. So because I connected with you and because you connected with me, not only did we make each other better, but because of our relationship, we were able to do some Red Sea ministry. Yeah, that's what, that's what you want to, we were able to do some Red Sea ministry. But you don't want to get to a point where you say, you know what, you were Jezebel to me. Or maybe you were Adam to me. And instead of getting closer to God, we got kicked out of the garden because we got together. The goal, how can we collect it? If, if you're in a dysfunctional and a toxic relationship right now, you can turn that thing around. But one of the, the, one of the things that has to happen is both of you have to be willing to do what it takes to take a few steps closer to God every day, every day. We're gonna, we're gonna start praying together. We're gonna start reading together. We're gonna start studying together. Every day, we're going to get closer to God and don't settle for anything less. May this be a blessing to your relationships. We want to thank you so much for tuning in and pray that you were blessed uh, by the message and dealing with toxic relationships. We want to be able to hear from you. We want to be able to hear your testimonies. We want to be able to hear uh, your stories. And if you are a supporter of North Colony, uh, please, we uh, encourage you to support this ministry, our teaching uh, and our evangelism and work in the community. Uh, there are several ways for you to be able to give and to be able to support. Uh, and we want you to be able to be a partner with us uh, as we strive to pull these messages uh, and these teachings uh, to the world. We thank you so much and we look forward uh, to hearing from you soon. North Colony, we are here to heal, help, and restore. Be blessed.